Hey, we're Aaron and Jennifer Smith with Marriage After God. Helping you cultivate an extraordinary marriage. And today we're going to share our personal journey with pornography in our marriage. Welcome to the Marriage After God podcast, where we believe that marriage was meant for more than just happily ever after. I'm Jennifer, also known as Unveiled Wife. And I'm Aaron, also known as Husband Revolution. We have been married for over a decade. And so far, we have four young children. We have been doing marriage ministry online for over seven years through blogging and social media. With the desire to inspire couples to keep God at the center of their marriage, encouraging them to walk in faith every day. We believe the Christian marriage should be an extraordinary one, full of life, love, and power that can only be found by chasing after God. Together. Thank you for joining us in this journey as we chase boldly after God's will for our life together. This is Marriage After God. Thank you all for joining us this week on our podcast. Um, We just wanted to invite you to leave us a review. Um, This is just one way to help us get the word out about the Marriage After God podcast and lets other people find us. And we really appreciate it. It just encourages our hearts. So if you could just um, scroll to the bottom of the, the podcast app and leave us a review. Yeah, a star rating is the easiest way to do it. All you have to do is hit a star. Um, but if you have extra time, we'd love a text review as well. Thank you, guys. Hey, we want to thank you for joining us. And we also want to invite you, if you've been enjoying the podcast, to consider supporting our podcast. And <laughs> in the way that you do that is go to shop.marriageaftergod.com and pick up one of our books that we've written. Uh, the ones we want to talk about today is our 31 Prayers for My Husband and 31 Prayers for My Wife bundle. We call it our Prayer Challenge, and uh, we encourage couples to do it. Thousands of couples have already gone through the challenge, and they've loved it. They go through it multiple times, actually, a year. So go to shop.marriageaftergod.com, pick up a copy of our 31 Marriage Prayers Challenge, and that would support your, our podcast. Thank you. Okay, moving right along, we are going to jump into our icebreaker question, which is, which one of you said, I love you first? That's an easy one. Give them a second to guess. You guys, you guys guess. Jennifer. It was me. Yeah. I couldn't wait any longer. Did I actually say I love you back? (laughs) So what happened was we were... I don't know if we were on a date or just hanging out, but I remember I was getting out of your car. I'm up in front of your house by your red mailbox. No, actually, Aaron has a terrible memory. (laughs) Oh, it's not right there? Where was this at? That's okay, honey. I'm not mad. (laughs) We were in the church parking lot. Oh. I was getting out of your black Honda, and I was getting into my car, and I got got out, and I I stood up, and then I leaned back in, and I said, oh, by the way, I love you. Because I was waiting, waiting. Did I waiting, skid waiting. away and the door slammed shut? <laughs> no, that didn't happen. But uh, you did uh, let a very long pause happen before you said anything, and it made me feel super awkward. And I said, and I, I might have even said, "Okay, I'm gonna go now," or something like that. And then you're like, "I'm just kidding." You start laughing, and you're like, "I love you too," almost as if I had already known, but you never said it. Well, you did already know. Yeah, I did. That's but really it was funny I made you wait. It felt good to have said it. <laughs> and I'm glad I say, said it. Yeah, I don't and have any we regrets. say it a lot now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do love you. Yeah. And I won't make you wait. I'll tell you all day, every day. <laughs> all day, every day. <laughs> yeah. Oh, good. So Jennifer said, I love you first. And then I made her wait a few seconds. Super awkward. Super long and seconds. And then you laughed. And then you said, I love you back. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So why don't we do a quick quote from a book? Okay. And this book is your book. Yeah, we we chose one from The Unveiled Wife. So it's not a typical quote that we've kind of been uh, sharing with you guys. It's a little bit more personal. Okay, this is found in The Unveiled Wife on page 153. And it says, We were devoted to making ourselves known to God and known to each other. I finally felt free from the bondage that was holding me captive. I could breathe deeply without fear of someone finding out who I was because I had chosen to make myself known. And this was a part of our story where we were divulging to each other our deep, dark secrets. Yeah. <laughs> where we were sharing our, our sins, things we were struggling with. We actually divulged everything, mm-hmm. talked about everything in our hearts. Mm-hmm. Um, that was a pretty pivotal moment in our marriage. Yeah. And that goes into what we're going to be talking about. That's why we picked the quote, mm-hmm. because we're going to be talking about that season of our marriage. We're going to be talking about a pretty large season, actually, of my life. And it has to do with pornography. Yeah, which I actually, well, we both didn't want to do this episode. We've been putting it off for months. <laughs> because 
I don't know why. It's just, I think it's one of those topics that's hard to dive into and expose. But like that quote said, I, I chose to make myself known. In our marriage, you've chose to make yourself known. And yeah. I, I believe that that created a safe place for um, trust to be built. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important for husbands and wives to hear our story and to hear, um, just to hear how we've exposed each, each, our hearts to each other. Yeah. And hopefully they could do that too. And not only have we exposed it to each other, but we've exposed it to others. Yeah. We've exposed the things that we've gone through, our, our dark secrets to other believers and through our platforms, through our ministries, the world. And one of the things that I love about how we are, you use the word expose. I love that word. The Bible tells us to drag that which is in the darkness into the light because mm -hmm. that which is in the light becomes light. Yeah. And that was our sin. The more it was hidden, the easier it was to keep doing it. Mm -hmm. And so we've been dragging it out ever since and keeping it out in the public, keeping it out in the light so that it doesn't, you know, live in us. Mm -hmm. So I want to start off by reading a scripture and it's in Ephesians five verse three. It says, but sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Paul's telling the Ephesians, you're saints, you're saints of the most high and sexual morality and impurity and covetousness. They should not even be named among you. Mm -hmm. Meaning I'm in a little bit in other translations says there shouldn't be a hint mm -hmm. of sexual morality. That's insane. Mm -hmm. Because in our current culture, in our current world, in my own life experience, I had not just a hint of sexual morality in my life, I was drenched in sexual morality. And Ephesians 5 verse 3 is very clear, and it's this isn't the only scripture that talks about this, that there shouldn't even be a hint of it among Christians. Which is so weird because, I mean, through our online platforms, we've shared about the topic of pornography before, and people, even Christians, have shared their acceptance of it. And I think we're we're living in a, a culture and an age where it's widely accepted, even if people aren't talking about it. Yeah, we're, we're desensitized to the grotesqueness of our sin. Which is another reason why we knew we had to do this episode. We mm -hmm. need to be willing to talk about it. Yeah, pretty much every time we've ever posted about pornography and how it's wrong and shouldn't even be in a marriage and how, and not that we're coming from perfection, we're coming from, well, actually, no, we've experienced this, it's it's wrong, and the Bible says we shouldn't do it, and God hates it. Mm -hmm. Christians, people claiming to be Christians in our comments will say, well, you're wrong, actually, it's fine as long as, and then fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, blown away but we shouldn't be surprised by that because the the world's being the world's going to be deceived so yeah. our heart today is to expose our story and i hope my our prayer we just prayed before this is that you listening if this is your story would begin to walk in freedom today mm -hmm. so that it that sexual morality and impurity and covetousness might not even be named in your marriage, mm -hmm. that there would be no hint of it. And so let's start, we're going to start with my experience and there's a bunch of questions I'm going to answer. And, um, but before we go to the, some of the questions I'm going to answer about my, my experience with pornography and where it came from and how I walked in it and my story behind that, I just want to read a, a letter I wrote to pornography, uh, in 2014 and it's on my blog. And it says this, dear pornography, we have known each other since I was a child and I feel as though I can tell you things that I could never tell anyone else. You know, all my secrets and all my fantasies and you've been by my side in the good times and in the bad. You spent time with me when I was lonely or bored and you comforted me when I was angry or hurt. It feels like you have always been there for me, but I need to get a few things off my chest. You promised me that after I got married, I wouldn't need you anymore. You made me believe that what we had was just a fling. I realize now that you never loved me. I am finally seeing your end game. You have stolen a piece of me like a master thief. You wanted everything from me, not just my eyes, but also my mind, heart, soul, and strength. You have promised a world to me that doesn't exist. You have threatened my marriage and my children. You have hurt my friends and family. You have destroyed the lives of girls, boys, men, and women all over the world and used me to help, all the while assuring me that no one would get hurt. 
Our relationship has been nothing but lies. You are not, nor have you ever been my friend. You are the reason I have lived with so much shame and embarrassment. You are the reason my wife has been so hurt. You have warped my perception of women in the world. I needed to write you this letter to let you know that it's over. I would tell you in person, but that would give you too much satisfaction. I have found a true friend. His name is Jesus. I wrote this letter a long time ago and posted it. It resonated with a ton of people. Uh, I got 4,000 shares. And it was just me verbalizing out loud the relationship I had with pornography so that I made it real. I was like, oh, I don't want to pretend like, oh, I'm just struggling in this. Like I actually verbalized what it was that I, how I related to it. It actually makes me really sad just hearing you read it out loud because it makes it even more so feel like such an intimate thing, such an intimate relationship that you had with this thing. Yeah. And um, I just, I, I, it makes me heartbroken over the many people who are, doing it who are addicted to it who have this kind of relationship yeah. with it and it's true it's a lie yeah uh and it, in in reality it destroys us it leads to death and it destroys the people that were, are being consumed by it mm-hmm. in the images mm-hmm. and do we care about those people mm-hmm. Do we care about ourselves? Do we care about our families? And we need we need to consider those things. So I'm going to be getting into some information about kind of where it started with me. And if you have questions as we go, Jennifer, you can ask me. Mm-hmm. And uh, so um, how old was I when I was exposed first to pornography? I actually don't know. I feel like maybe seven, eight years old. I can't, I don't have a very good memory of my, my younger years. Um, but I, I do remember one of the first experiences I had with it was I was walking home from school and I found a, it was like a playing card on the ground with a nude woman on it. And I remember keeping it. And I remember that being my first experience with it. Um, I don't remember how I got uh, connected on the internet with, with it. I don't remember how I've seen it on TV, but I've been exposed to pornography for many, many, many years. And not just exposed to it, but I've exposed myself to it and craved it and sought after it. Um since a very young age and it went with me. I literally thought when I was younger that all I needed to do was get married and it would fix my, my lustful cravings because mm-hmm. what they did was they being exposed so young and right at the, you know, puberty when I'm already going to be naturally more hormone, hormonal and more testosterone and all of those things that come with, with puberty. I, it was heightened extremely from a young age and it just continued on until even into marriage i actually remember you know before we got married we did talk about that aspect of um feeling like because you admitted to me that you struggled with pornography and i also wrote it off as like well doesn't every guy do that that was my perspective of it and we both believed that it would be like a non-issue when we got married that it would just go away Right. So while we were dating, you had no red flags about it. I mean, I hated it then and it hurt me then, but I, I figured marriage would be mm-hmm. the solution. Well, what you said was that you thought, well, I guess every guy struggles with that. And, you know, we'll just, when we get married, we'll walk together and we'll figure mm-hmm. it out and fit and it'll be fixed. Yeah. Um, and I actually believe that too. I was so entrenched in it that I couldn't imagine men not struggling with it. And I think there was two reasons I, I did that. One, pretty much everything I heard from other people, believers and pastors and mentors was like, well, yeah, yeah. Everyone struggles with that. And there's that book, every man's battle. Like we, that's the thing we've heard Mm -hmm. about this. So I just believed literally every man struggled with it and it was normal. Yeah, I was wrong and we shouldn't do it. And I felt shameful and I should be better at it. But I wasn't actually ever told by anyone that I didn't have to do it, that I wasn't slave to it, that as a believer, I could walk in freedom from it and that it was going to destroy me. I don't remember hearing that ever. Mm -hmm. I remember how it made me feel. Um, How did it make you feel? Well, it it made me feel gross. I hated that I couldn't stop it. Probably like any addict. Like, why do I keep doing this? Mm -hmm. Why can't I stop? Mm -hmm. I feel like I have no control. But then at the same time, I wanted it. I enjoyed it. I loved it. I couldn't say that out loud. When I would talk about it, it was always like, I hate this. I don't want to do this anymore. But internally, I I really did love it, even though I didn't recognize that Mm -hmm. back then. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I can't remember ever having a real 
conversation about sexual purity. I remember being told I shouldn't have sex before marriage. I remember being talked about it a little bit, but I don't remember purity discussion. I remember being caught a few times with pornography and having, you know, a short discussion of how it's not good and we shouldn't do that. But I couldn't, I don't remember having these serious discussions of this can't happen. It is going to destroy you. You need to stop. (laughs) I don't remember that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And it maybe did happen, but I don't remember it being, uh, it wasn't memorable for Mm -hmm. me. It wasn't something that changed my direction. Um, from anyone, my parents, from pastors, pastors, uh, yeah. friends in reality, even when I would try and, you know, ways I would try and deal with it was just abstinence. Like, well, I'm just going to try and go, Oh, I went a month and mm-hmm. I didn't, you know, mess up was my, my term. Um, I would have accountability partners, you know, that's what we all do, but all my accountability partners also struggled with pornography and weren't changing. So all we would do is come together and commiserate and say, well, God's good, grace of God, those kinds of things. But no one ever changed. No one ever, mm. no one ever had an authority in my life to say like, Hey, I'm walking in, in purity. You should too. Mm. I didn't, I actually didn't know anyone. Wow. I've never met someone back then that walked in purity that didn't struggle with pornography, which gave me a very small worldview actually. <laughs> Cause mm. I thought, I literally thought everyone struggled with it. And I'm sure there's people listening right now thinking like, well, doesn't everyone? (laughs) Um, No, everyone doesn't struggle with it. Many do, but it's a lie from Satan to believe that it's just the thing that everyone's going to struggle with. Well, if we believe that everybody struggles with it, it just makes it more normal. And then yeah, why why change? It's another justification for it. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I would confess to God all the time and, and just, you know, remember that God loves me and remind myself I would read scripture that would make me actually feel more shameful because I'd be like, wait a minute, why don't, why doesn't my life line up with what the Bible says? Mm. Like, shouldn't it? Shouldn't, when I read this, oh, that's what a believer is. I would have to, in roundabout ways, work around what the Bible says to be who I was as a quote unquote Christian, which is wrong because yeah. we're supposed to align our lives with what the Bible says, not with how we feel and then try and make the Bible fit into that, which is what I had to do because it, my life didn't line up with it at all. So then we got married and it didn't stop. No, it actually, I, I feel like at times it got worse. Well, just to catch people up on our story, the first four years of our marriage, um, actually it's kind of humorous now that I think about it with your um, addiction, <laughs> our biggest struggle was sex, sex. And yeah, I remember telling God, like, God, just give me a wife. I just want to be able to have sex with my wife and I'll stop doing this. And then I get married <laughs> and it's literally the hardest thing possible, the thing that we can't do. <laughs> so I experienced excruciating pain every time we tried. And so for four years, our marriage just got tougher and tougher as far as our relationship because yeah. of this issue. And and because we weren't coming together and being, you know, experiencing that part of our, our relationship, you dove even further into I pornography. definitely use it as a excuse and a justification because I thought to myself like, well, I can't even have the one person I should be able to have. So mm-hmm. I got this over here and it was wrong, completely wrong, but Looking back, God absolutely used our struggle with sex to show the depravity in my own heart and yours. Mm -hmm. I was going to say about lust, pornography, uh, and these things. I'm like a lot of sexual, (laughs) yeah, lots of things. But he's he was definitely saying like I don't want any of this, and he was willing to discipline us. And I believe that's what it was. I believe that that season of our life was disciplined because he's like, you're my children. And he says, I discipline those who I love and I love you. Mm -hmm. And he, and I, he was done with us walking our own way and walking in that sort of sin. And now I can't say like we walked free from it and then boom, we were healed. It was much more complex than that. But looking back, I know that's what God was doing in us. Yeah. So are you saying that we struggled with sexual intimacy because you struggled with pornography? Uh, I I believe so. I believe that God was disciplining us. He was disciplining me. Like I told him the one thing I wanted was a a wife I can have sex with. And he's like, that's not going to fix it. Mm. (laughs) And it's, and he, and I should be able to walk in freedom with him regardless if my marriage is perfect. 
Like I, I, it's not a justification having a broken marriage, having a broken sex life, having these things that I think give me permission to break his heart and his laws and, and walk opposite of how he's called me to walk mm. when my greatest relationship should be with him, which mm. is what I've always said. I have like, no, everything is about God and I love God. And he's like, well, you know, as Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. You know, if you love me, you'll, in first John, he says, those who practice righteousness are righteous. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't practicing righteousness. I was, I had no integrity when I was alone. I knew what I was going to do. And you knew too. Uh, I, I didn't trust you. No, I didn't trust myself. I just go back to that point though. I, I want to talk about trust, but I want to go back to, you know, you saying that, um, our, let's call it a drought. Cause that's what it was. It was a sexual drought in our marriage. Yeah was correlated with this addiction to pornography because as much as I, I I see that, I also know that it was layered because he used that time for so many other things to mm-hmm. reveal a lot to us. And I don't want that I don't want them listening just to go, oh, that's kind of strange, but a cool, you know, little revelation. There was a lot more that Well of course like that God is infinite and he he orchestrated a lot of things in our life for many purposes. Mm-hmm to put us on this journey with this ministry, to uh, make us our, our unity, our oneness stronger, to use us in the lives of others, like lots of things, mm-hmm. to teach us things. To teach us things. But yeah. it tells us that the, in the Bible that, that our Father in Heaven disciplines His children. And if He didn't discipline us, we'd be illegitimate children. But because we're His children, He disciplines us. I just wanted to highlight that to show that we, in, in going through those things, that what our heart should be is to recognize what God's doing. And that he loves us and that he cares for us. You know, what's that quote? Uh, you know, he loves us the way we are, but loves us too much to leave us there. Oh, yeah. Um, and so he changes us and he he draws us to himself and he makes us more like his son, Jesus. He when, definitely used that time to do that in our life. Yeah. And so what for you, Jennifer, because I brought this into my marriage mm-hmm. and I didn't know if you struggled with anything at the time um, early in the marriage. But what did my addiction to pornography, how did it make you feel? How did you deal with it? What were some of the highlights or lowlights, I should say? Yeah, I'm like, there were no highlights. Um, um, from our from that part of our story. Knowing that you struggled with this was painful. And I felt betrayed as your wife. Mm-hmm. And there was a lot of deep hurt, a lot of pain. Um, but what's interesting is also wrapped up in a lot of insecurity. And Mm -hmm. I felt like it was pointed back at me as if I wasn't good enough for you. And so on top of the pain of betrayal and mistrust, there was also this layer of I'm not good enough for you and it's my fault. Right. Like you're causing me to like, well, if I was prettier or if I could give him this part of my body. Yeah. If my body actually worked and we were experiencing, you know, an awesome sex life, maybe he wouldn't, maybe marriage would have fixed it. So then I felt yeah. at fault for it and that was really painful. And so anytime that you confessed to me or, you know, the, the truth was exposed, I felt just as, mm-hmm. um, at fault for it. Yeah. And I remember you would say those sorts of things and I would try and like comfort you and be like, no, 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 not at all. Not at all. But what's unfortunate is I, I was only comforting you back then and trying to help you back then for the sake of my own shame. Like I didn't like that I made you feel that way. I didn't like that you responded that way. But instead of changing, I just tried to help you cope with it. Yeah. <laughs> Which is wrong of me. I wasn't a very good spiritually. Well, we didn't then. know back then. We, yeah. I feel like spiritually we were so immature that we didn't know how to navigate this right. We didn't have much close fellowship back then. Mm-hmm. We've talked about that in past episodes. Um, Which would have helped us see it sooner probably. If we had people close closer to us knowing us. Not just people, but spiritually mature people. Yeah. People who would challenge this area of our life. But again, we have to expose it and we have to tell people yeah. how we're struggling if we want that kind of correction. Yeah. And we most people don't. It to ourselves. Yeah. So I also remember, um, you know, anytime that you would say, hey, we have to talk, my heart would drop because I'd be, you know, waiting for the yeah. bomb, the truth bomb of like, I have to confess again. <laughs> and I hated that feeling. And my heart also ached with anxiety every time I left you at home alone because I just knew. You knew it was going to come when mm-hmm. you got back. Yeah. And um, and when I did come home and you told me you messed up, like you said, you would say yeah. um, it 
just affirmed my distrust in you. Were you ever surprised? No. Yeah, because you knew I was going to, which is such an unfortunate thing to make my wife believe, only know that about me, that I'm I'm not a trustworthy person, that I have no integrity, and she's going to feel small and insignificant because of something I'm choosing to do. And I think the reason, no, I don't think, the, the reason we are getting real with this stuff is because these are the things that aren't said to us. And so we can easily minimize what we're doing. I minimize it a lot with you. Yeah. I would just be like, well, it was only a, a, for a little bit. It was like, it was nothing. It was not a big deal. And like all I ever tried to do when I was apologizing to you was minimize the shame and the guilt that I saw in your face. And I, I deeply regret that part of our marriage and the things that I walked in that I didn't believe the truth that I've, I, that I've seen and read in the Bible that I thought that was for other people, not myself. Um, I believed I was still trapped by it, even though I was a believer. I believed that I was still trapped in my sin. I believed that it had power over me that it didn't actually have. And I let it into our marriage. And in, in the Bible, it tells us to keep the marriage bed pure. And I didn't. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so I thank God that he showed me these things and he was patient with me because he, how often do you feel like, man, I'm surprised God just didn't strike me down. Cause like he's, he's sovereign. He's a good, he's a good God, but he's a just God. And man, I justly deserved not what I've been given the patience and the reconciliation and a wife who remained with me when you probably had a, a good reason and a good right to leave me for, for breaking our vows so many times because the next truth we want to, make everyone listening realize is that pornography is not just like, Oh, this little sin that I did over here. And like, it's not a big deal. It's not attached to anything. The Bible tells us clearly that sexual sin is, is special. <laughs> it it does something different to us because it's against our own bodies. And especially in marriage, when you and your wife are one, I was going to say it's against your one. It's against your body. It's against my wife. And this is the, the truth bomb. Pornography is adultery. It's adultery. I was a cheater on my wife. I broke her trust time and time again. I broke faithfulness with her. And that's the reality. And if anyone that's listening right now is walking in this and is telling themselves, well, it's only every once in a while. It's not that big of a deal. Uh, You know, I can stop any time, uh, whatever we, words we use, we are committing adultery on our spouse and we are not practicing righteousness and we are not walking in light as he is in the light. And those are truths that we need to say out loud and we need to recognize them for what they are. I just want to be honest. This episode has been so hard for me. And I just feel like I, there's things that I want to share and then I get this lump in my throat and my eyes start watering and we've had to stop, you know, three times just to pause so I can breathe. (laughs) But, um, pornography hurts. Pornography kills and it kills oneness and unity in marriage. It kills trust. Mm -hmm. It kills love. It kills faith, faith. (laughs) And it severs our relationship with the father. Yeah. It severs our relationship between husband and wife. Like Mm -hmm. our relationship was crumbling because of this. And I just, I I feel so emotional. I think even sitting here listening again to our story, because I know we're not the only ones who have been hurt by the pain of pornography. There are so many husbands and wives, maybe, maybe, them listening right now Mm -hmm. have walked this or are experiencing it. Or maybe just last night they had that hard conversation where they're in tears over it because they want it gone so badly Mm -hmm. and it just keeps coming and keeps coming and keeps coming. And it's going to keep coming. The enemy, (laughs) the enemy hates marriage. The enemy hates what we're doing and it's going to keep coming because he knows that it will destroy what we have. 
And I want to, your words are powerful, but I want to remind us that our words are powerful. And you keep saying pornography, it's coming, it's coming as if it's something coming at us. And this is one of the lies I believed that pornography was something happening to me. And when something happens to us, it's out of our control. Pornography, it was not happening to me. Yes, the same issue kept coming up and we had to keep dealing with it, but, and I'm not correcting you, Jennifer, but I want the people listening to not take anything we say and say, see, there it is. It's coming at me. Yeah. No. And when I said it's coming, I mean, the enemy is dangling that temptation in front of us because he knows our flesh is weak Yep. and we have to be willing to stand strong against it. And so if we think it's something happening to us, we'll never walk strong. Mm -hmm. It's, it's something I believed. I believed it was a outward force that I had no control over, but it is not because if that was the case, then no one's free. Mm. And the things that the Bible tells us are lies. Mm. And so our encouragement to those listening is to believe the truth. Proclaim the truth. So confession, which is saying what's going on, saying what you're doing, what you are choosing to do, which is the key. Not coming like, oh, it happened again. Oh, I messed up again. Oh, I slipped and fell into this thing again. No. Confessing that you chose again to cheat on your spouse. That you chose again to walk in unfaithfulness with your God. That's true confession. And then repentance is to turn the other way. I am no longer going to choose to walk in that. Because if it's something that we accidentally fall into, if it's something that happens to us, then there is no need to repent because you don't know if you're going to slip. You're walking on this journey and you're just going to fall into the pit by accident. And that's just your, you know, destiny. But that's actually not true because that goes against everything Jesus came to do on the cross. He came to set us free from the bonds of sin and death. And the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that will bring life to our mortal bodies. That's what the Bible tells us. And in a little bit, we're going to get through, through more scripture just so you listening can hear the truth about this. And I want to bring up something you said, Jennifer, that pornography hurts us and it destroys us. And I want to highlight one more truth. It was something that I never realized until I started walking in purity. And God was revealing to me who I was and the things I was doing is that pornography doesn't just hurt us, the ones consuming the pornography. We are literally condoning and cheering on and paying for things that we would never condone or cheer on or pay for a Christian to do. Mm-hmm. And a lot of these men, women, whoever's in these videos or photos, many of them are forced into it. And even the ones that choose it, we're literally saying, yeah, keep doing that. Keep doing that. We are choosing to hold hands with someone to hell by the thing we are consuming. And if Christians would realize that, if I would have realized that earlier, would I have stopped? Maybe. If I would have realized like, man, I'm actually like, partaking, participating in someone's journey to eternity away from God. And it's easy for us to think like, well, they're just things. It's just a video. Well, no, those are people in those videos, real people that are made in God's image. And I I just hope that this is hitting home with those listening. I hope that people are hearing our, our hearts of concern and love and are also being having their eyes opened mm-hmm. and their hearts opened and that true godly repentance would come from this. Yeah. So I remember there was two pivotal moments in our marriage that stand out to me. I think you'll know what I'm talking about, but um, they are pivotal because they helped you change in this area. And so I want to share them so that those listening can yeah. be inspired by it. And hopefully it, this, ho- hopefully this moment right here becomes a pivotal moment for them. Amen. Yeah. 
So I remember it was just after we had Elliot. He was just a little baby. And I was sitting in a rocking chair midday trying to rock him. And you were sitting at the desk in our bedroom and you started telling me and confessing how Mm -hmm. you had messed up again. (laughs) And normally, I mean, you list an emotion and I've expressed it. (laughs) Tears uncontrollably, like just all of it. All rightfully so because of what I've done to you. But this time I just sat pretty much gripping Elliot's little body and, and patting his back and my heart it was just so burdened for you. And I remember... It was actually your first time f- thinking about me in that way because of what I was going through. Yeah. Yeah. Like if tables were turned, yeah, putting myself in your shoes. But I just, I, I questioned you on your faithfulness to me because on the outside, we were Christians moving forward in our marriage. And mm-hmm. at this point, we actually had already been reconciled and determined to, you know, Um, stay together Mm -hmm. and you messed up again and I questioned you on your faithfulness and I and I reminded you what scripture says about it being adultery and I know you have already mentioned that today but I remember just reminding you in this in that moment that you were committing adultery against me Mm -hmm. and I questioned you know how you would want our future to go I questioned how you would want our son's future to go I remember all this you asked me if I actually feared God. You you asked me if I actually loved God. You were you were challenging me at the core of what I was doing, not just this one event. Oh, I forgive you for the event. You you told me like you you need to realize what you were doing, Aaron. Mm-hmm. And I remember it it was like shocking. I was like, oh my gosh, this is different. First of all, because usually I'm like looking forward to you. <laughs> Not looking forward to it, but I'm expecting an outburst, a rebel man. Why yeah. you did it again? Don't you know how this makes me feel? Um, but you, you, you went from you actually loved me selflessly, because even though you were totally hurt, you instead told me the truth in love. You said, "Aaron, you are committing adultery," and I think that was actually the first time I we recognize that's what I was doing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'm laughing because I'm embarrassed, but that was a pivotal moment. And that began actually over the next few years, me walking in the start of the true change. Like I I did still have, um, a weakness. I I still fell back into it. I I don't want to say fell back into it. I still chose it, but it was, it became much less Mm -hmm. and much less. And then what the next event that happened was the straw that broke the camel's back. Like the, the, like it was the thing. Like, so you opened my eyes to like, man, I have to change. This is not okay. What I'm doing. And then this next moment I'm sitting in my car with our pastor and pastor and mentor. And he's, and we, we just had dinner and we were hanging out and he said, Aaron, are you walking in purity? And I said, well, no, you know, recently I, you know, did this and cause I want to be honest and I'm trying to walk in, in re- repentance and openness and, and light. And he says, well, Aaron, he's like, nothing's going to change until you believe the truth. He's like, you, you, you need to believe the truth. And I said, well, what, what do you mean? Because the way I talked was, Oh, it, it happened to me again. I, I fell into, I stumbled into, Oh, you know, st- what was me? Like, as if something was happening to me. So, cause I was still not thinking clearly about this, even though you challenged me correctly, I still wasn't thinking clearly. And he said, you are not a slave to your addiction to pornography. Pornography is not something that has control over you, which I didn't believe when he was saying it. Cause I believed it controlled me. And then he said, and, and also Aaron, you need to admit and confess that you love your sin. He said, you need to say it because you do. And I said, I don't love it. And he's like, well, your actions are proving different. You say with your mouth that you don't, and then you say with your actions that you do. And it went right into my heart. And it was the first time in my life 
that I was able to say with my mouth out loud that I actually loved pornography. And what that meant was as I actually was able to fully con- confess because before I was confessing about the fruit of my sin, not confessing the sin that I loved my lust. Which if people are wondering my response, it's I hate, I hate, I hate hearing it. I hate knowing it. I hate, I hate all of that, but I think it's necessary in order to overcome. Well, true confession is necessary. I had to be able to admit the truth Mm -hmm. because I was walking in lies and the lies were keeping me in the darkness and the lies were keeping me trapped when the trap was my lies. It was, it was, there was no trap. There was no chains because God broke those chains on the cross. Mm-hmm. And he's like, you need to recognize that, 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 that is the truth. You have not stopped sinning because you love your sin. And so I, and once he said it out loud and once I said it out loud, I realized, wait a minute, I don't want to love my sin. And so I confessed, Lord, forgive me for my love of my sin and change me. And that was the last time. I think there was one other little time after that, that was, and I'm not trying to minimize significantly different kind of sinning, but in the same area. And I confessed that out loud Mm -hmm. to Matt and to you Mm -hmm. and that was it. Mm -hmm. And it's been how many years now? Five. Five. But those are the pivotal conversations was you telling me the truth in love Mm -hmm. and then another brother telling me the truth in love. Not, oh, sorry. Yeah, we all, you know, we're all going to struggle. And, you know, let's just get back up and let's just, you know, try harder next time. But that's not, that is not what God's asking us to do. He's not asking us to try harder. He's asking us to walk in the truth. And the truth is, let's read some of these verses. The truth is, Galatians 5.1, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. And that's what I was doing. I kept submitting to a yoke of slavery that didn't exist. I was allowing a yoke to be put on me that didn't need to be there. So, I'm free. That's what Christ came for, freedom. Would you read Romans 6.6? We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Oh, so it's not that I have to try harder. I am not enslaved to sin. So I need to walk in the actual truth. Which is 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So am I walking in this old self while pretending to be a new self? Talk about a marriage fixing things. Yeah, and the marriage doesn't <laughs> fix it. Christ has already fixed it. No, the marriage of Christ, the being one. Oh, yeah, we're, we're being one with the, with the body of Christ. We're his bride, and it yeah. says that he's going to come back to a pure, mm-hmm. white, and without blemish, bride. Mm-hmm. That's, who, that's what I'm a part of. That's who I am. That's who you are listening. Yeah, how dare him come back to a bride that's been... You know, dancing in the mud with her dress, you know, so those listening, your old self has been crucified. It's been crucified. Christ set us free on the cross. Ephesians 4, 17 through 24. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding and alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. That was my life. I was walking as he's telling Christians to not walk as Gentiles. do. I was walking that way mm-hmm. in my ignorance. Alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of hearts. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But this is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus to put off your old self, Aaron, put off your old self, (laughs) which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. That's crazy. That uses the word deceitful desires. They trick us. Mm -hmm. They're desires that are deceitful and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. 
So my trying harder is actually just putting on the new self. Christ's likeness. 1 John 2, 1. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. What's awesome about that is when we're walking in righteousness and we stumble because we've chosen to or we haven't we weren't walking in the, the fle- we weren't walking in the spirit but we were walking in the flesh we have an advocate but the things that we're reading right now have been written so that we won't sin right so that we will actually walk in the truth first john 2 28 and 29 and now little children abide in him so that when he appears we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming if you know that he is righteous you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. I love that it says practice, first of all. Because what that means is that we are not yet righteous, but we are becoming righteous. Mm -hmm. And as we practice it, we get better at it. So am I practicing my sinful desires and getting better at those things? Or am I practicing righteousness and getting worse at my sinful desires? And that was, that's my life now is I'm getting worse at my sinful desires and I'm actually getting better at avoiding temptation and knowing what temptation is and, and being strong under the temptation and fleeing from the temptation and talking about the temptation and now encouraging others to do the same. So actually I was going to mention that how you walk in authority now and challenge other believers. And, and I um, can be confident that you're going to walk our children through these things that you can teach them. And I don't know, I just, I love that you have this authority that you can say, I've overcome this you can too which is amazing because when we see other people overcome something it makes it that much more believable that we can Mm -hmm. and so you're listening to this and if you're thinking man i can't do that stop believing the lies you have been set free by christ you have the power of the holy spirit in you you've been given everything that pertains to life and godliness just like i have i'm not special I haven't been given, some, given something that you haven't been given. Jennifer hasn't been given something that you haven't been given. We have Christ in us. Mm-hmm. We have we could put on the new self created after the likeness of God. Something that we mention in um, our book coming out, Marriage After God, is that Jesus didn't come back to kind of save you. He came back to save you. <laughs> he came back to fully save us. F- today, when Jesus teaches the disciples how to pray, he says, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, which is cool because we can actually have his will on earth Mm -hmm. in our life. Now we haven't, our bodies are still going to decay and we're going to still see death and these bodies are going to fall apart because they're not yet redeemed. But you know, what is fully redeemed our spirit and he's renewing us day by day and he's giving us a new mind and and a new spirit. And he's, and through his word and through walking in community and through being walking in light and truth, We can actually walk the way God has enabled us to walk. It tells us in Malachi that he will write his laws on our hearts, on tablets of flesh. They're no longer on stones that can be broken. They're on hearts of flesh. His laws are written on our hearts. And not only has he showed us in our hearts how we can, how we should walk, but he's empowered us to do so through the power of his son and his spirit. So I don't know. I hope that was vulnerable enough. And I, my, again, our prayer is that those listening, you would not be freed from this addiction and this struggle with sin and pornography, but that you would recognize that you are free and that you do not have to choose to be submitted to it. You don't have to choose it. You can choose actually to walk away. You could choose actually to turn the computer off. You can choose actually to put your phone down. You can choose to run away as fast as you can. We can choose that and we are empowered to do so through the Holy Spirit. So if uh, this episode encourages them to go have a conversation and there's confession and reconciliation, do you want to share some things that we've learned over time that could help them? Yeah, I will say on my part, or for those that are going to do the confessing, and we talked about confession, 
in one of our episodes and they should go back and listen to that actually. Um, don't minimize meaning, well, it was just this. It wasn't as big as a deal. You think it was only for a moment. Just say, I did this. And then the second thing I would always try and do that I do, sh- I shouldn't do was I tried to control your reaction. Mm. Please don't be mad. I know that I was wrong. Please don't be sad. Please don't be frustrated. Crying? Or why are you crying? Yeah. And so I, when I started walking in purity, I purposed that if I was going to confess to you, I was just going to tell you what I did, when I did it, and then I was going to be quiet. And so on my part, I, I mean, as the person receiving the confession, um, something that I've learned is, well, the first thing is God created us with a lot of different range of emotions, but he created us with emotions. And so mm-hmm. the first thing is acknowledging that you feel. And the second one is you're still called to have self-control in those feelings. And, and you're allowed to have the feelings. And you're allowed to have those feelings. So you may cry, you may get angry, you may get all of the things, but you still are required to have self-control in them. And that doesn't mean that you just shut it off and you don't express those emotions. Mm-hmm. It just means that you don't sin in your um, emotions. And so I just wanted to to share that as yeah. a counterpart to what you... And on the person receiving the confession, the other spouse... Your job is to not just love your spouse, but to speak truth in love like you did that day. Mm -hmm. You very calmly and lovingly said, you are walking a very dangerous line. Mm -hmm. You are committing adultery and you are harming our marriage and what you're doing will destroy us and you and you must change. And then the the biggest thing after all of that is reconciliation. It should always be for the purpose of reconciliation. And we hope that it's for yeah. reconciliation in your guys' marriages. And reconciliation can happen even though trust is still broken. Mm-hmm. Because the reconciliation is knowing that, hey, we are still one, but we are going to work on this trust thing mm-hmm. because you have hurt me and we're going to walk it out together. And I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to avoid it being healed, but it's going to take time mm-hmm. and that's got to be okay. Mm-hmm. because it's not like a switch that gets flipped. There's been unfaithfulness. There's been brokenness. There's been sin and there's consequences to that sin. But as a team, you walk towards healing and restoration on both parties. And you do that by prayer. You do that by fasting. You do that by walking faithfully and abiding in the word of God and abiding in the word of God. And then you also do that in community. Mm-hmm. you don't do it alone. If you're a brother dealing with this, you find other brothers that are going to say, dude, stop it, mm-hmm. that have authority in your life because they walk in purity also. If you're the wife, you find girls that are going to be like, you can't do this. Mm-hmm. You need to walk in purity. And the goal is oneness, unity, healing, righteousness, holiness. For the purpose that we always go back to is that God has a job for our marriages He's got a ministry for us to do, and we will not be able to do it if we're stuck in sin. Yeah, we need to be pure, and we need to present his bride pure. And that's what we get to do. We get to purify ourselves. We get to practice righteousness. And we get to chase after God every day. And I, I just pray that this brings freedom today. I pray that hundreds, thousands of couples today yeah. would find not just healing, but f- realize the freedom that they have, and that they would be the ones that people look at and say, I didn't know you can walk in freedom like that. And then they'll say, actually, this is what the Bible says. <laughs> and they'll be able to help other Christians walk that way as well. What an incredible ripple effect for the body of Christ. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us on this episode. It was it was vulnerable and I appreciate you sharing, Aaron. And um, I can see that there's probably going to be a lot of questions probably come up from this probably and we might have to do another episode but that's okay um but we do want to invite you guys to pray with us and um close out the episode with with um this prayer from aaron dear lord thank you for your loving patience and kindness towards us thank you for your mercy and forgiveness lord i pray as christian men and women we would practice walking in righteousness i pray we would pursue purity as you are pure I pray that as Christian men and women who proclaim you to be Lord in our life, that we would not walk in this sin anymore. Change us, transform us, and cut out any dead flesh and wicked way that is in us. 
Help us to fear you and love you. Help us to see the truth about pornography, that it is destructive, sinful, immoral, and that it is adultery. Your word tells us that there should not even be a hint of sexual morality named among us as Christians. Help us to live with integrity. Help us to be transparent and honest in marriage. Help us to choose reconciliation over isolation in marriage. We are your saints, and I pray we would walk in a manner worthy of your call in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us this week, and uh, we can't, we look forward to what the Lord's going to do in your life and the testimonies that are going to come from the truth that people heard today. We'll see you next week. Did you enjoy today's show? Find many more encouraging stories and resources at marriageaftergod.com and let us help you cultivate an extraordinary marriage. 